Hello, this is William from Visual Components. In this video, I'm going to show you how to model an articulated robot using Visual Components 4.1. Before you get started, make sure you are using Visual Components Professional or Premium because you need access to the modeling tab here. This tutorial also requires several files, which you can find a link to in the video description, as well as on our Academy. Let's take a look at those files now. The first file is the data sheet of the robot we are going to model. In this case, it's an Epson C8 series robot. In the data sheet, you have to look at two pages. Page 17 gives you the dimensions of the robot. Page 23 gives you the specifications table. And from here, you can find the max operating speed of the robot's joints and their range of motion. We are going to model the C8A701 robot. The next file is the CAD file for the robot's geometry. Here we're using a step file. I also included a PDF and PowerPoint presentation for this tutorial in case you want to look at it, edit it, or translate it into a different language. Let's open the PDF tutorial. We're modeling an articulated robot that has six degrees of freedom, or three rotary joints. Remember, this tutorial requires Visual Components Professional or Premium. I am using Visual Components Premium 4.1 for the tutorial, and I made the tutorial in March of 2018. I do want to give a special shout out to Jamal Muhammad for helping me collect and develop the material for this tutorial. Remember, you need the data sheet for the robot, as well as the CAD file for its geometry. The first step is to import that geometry, so let's do that now. You can go to the Home tab or the Modeling tab, and then on the ribbon, go to the Import group and click the Geometry command. You now want to open the Step file. In the Import Model Task pane, you want to use a tessellation quality of extra low, because we're trying to get the data count of the robot, its triangles, as close to 100,000, because that is an OK limit for representing the look and feel of the robot in the 3D world. For example, if I was to use a tessellation quality of extra high, and then click the Analyze button here, this will calculate how many triangles the robot will have. So let's see what we get. Well, oh, it's quite a lot. It's over 500,000 triangles. So that is way too much for this case. I'll now try to move the triangle count as close to 100,000 as possible by using an extra low option. I'll then click the Analyze button. Let's see what we get. And then we're about 130,000 triangles, so that's as close as we can get, and that's fine. For the include options, you do not want to import what you don't need, so you can clear the hidden markups and points options. I am going to import the materials, but not the textures. You can see I'm using a material creation rule, so when I import a material from the CAD file, I'm going to map it to the closest material I have in my system library that comes with my 4.1 product. For the feature tree, this will contain the geometry. I'm using the optimize option. For organizing the geometry into sets, I'm going to use the collapsed option here. Beginning in 4.1, you have the option to import mathematical data if the CAD file supports it, for example, BREPS. If you do select this option, you can always change the tessellation quality of the geometry after you import it but we're going to keep things simple and just use the collapsed option. For up axis, I will use the default of positive z axis. I'll now click import. This will import the geometry and store it in a new component. You can see that the orientation of the robot is wrong. We need to stand it up. So with the component selected, I'll go to the origin group and click the move command. Notice in the 3D world I have a move tool. These larger coordinate axes show you the coordinate system you're working with, whereas the smaller ones here, this is showing you the object coordinate system, in this case the component. So what we want to do is align the z-axis of our component in this direction and the x-axis in this direction. So let's first rotate around the x-axis and then the y-axis. In the Move Origin task pane, I'm using the World Coordinate System, I'll rotate around the x-axis negative 90 degrees. You can see the change here in the 3D world. So now the smaller z-axis is pointing this way. 
I'll now rotate around the y-axis 90 degrees and now the x-axis is pointing this way and that's what I want. But we have not confirmed these changes yet so in the Move Origin Task Pane click the Apply button here. I'll now go to my Component Properties panel. I'm still using the World Coordinate System and I'll reset the rotations around the x-axis and the y-axis. And now our robot is standing up. The next step is to add a template robot to the 3D world. Whenever you are modeling a new robot, it is always best to take a robot from our eCatalog panel because it already has the logic and behaviors you need to make your robot work. To do that, let's go to our eCatalog panel, go to Models by Manufacturer. We're working with an Epson robot that's in the C8 series. So let's do a search for C8. We already have the robot we're modeling in our eCat, but let's use the C8XL as our template robot. So remember, you want to find a robot that is very similar to the one you're modeling. So in this case, the robot is a bit bigger, but they're both articulated robots, and they're from the same company and the same series. Let's now move the geometry that we imported into our template robot. To do that, I'll go to the Modeling tab, this context allows you to select features in the 3D world. One thing to notice is that right now I can see the frame features in the 3D world. I don't want to remove those from my template robot. So in the 3D world toolbar, I'll go to my frame types arrow and turn off the visibility of frames. So now when I go to select features, I won't select the frames in this template robot. In the manipulation group, I'm going to use the freeform selection. This allows you to draw a selection area in the 3D world. So let's select all of the geometry we imported in this robot here. I'll drag the mouse to create a selection area. Very abstract art, I know. Now I have all the geometry or the features containing that geometry selected. I'll right click and copy them. Let's now move this geometry into our template robot, but we don't need this geometry here so we can delete it. I'll create another selection area. I am a very good artist, I know. Now we have the geometry selected. Let's right click and delete it. And now in our component graph panel, I'll select the root node of the template robot. And now the root feature, right click and then paste in the geometry I copied from the new component. So now our imported geometry is in our template robot. If you make a mistake when deleting the geometry and you deselect your template robot, you can always go back to the home tab then go to your cell graph panel and select the template robot from this list here. Let's go back to the modeling tab and we no longer need this new component so we can delete it. You can double click the feature at the bottom of the robot here to select its node. There's only one node in the component so right now I have its root node selected. I can right click and now delete the component. Let's now work with our template robot here. I will double click the feature at the bottom to select its node, which is also the root node of the component, and you can verify that here in the component graph panel. But you can see our template robot is still using its old name of C8XL. We need to change that. Let's go to our PDF tutorial. We already completed step one by importing the geometry. I do give you more information about the import options for tessellation quality, materials, feature tree, geometry, and up axis. We then modify the component's origin to make the robot stand up. We then added a template robot and then move the geometry that we imported into our template robot. We now have to save our template robot as a new component. And we want to use this name here called C8A701S. So I'll copy it. And important, always when you're saving something as a new component, make sure you have the new VCID option selected. Because this VCID is a unique ID to identify your component. So with the component selected, I'll go to the Component Properties panel and change the name. You can see it updated here at the top of the Component Properties panel, as well as in the Component Graph panel here. I'll now go to the component group, but you don't want to click the save component command because that will save the template robot and override the C8XL robot you have in your system. So you want to save this 
as a new component. So click the Save As button. And then in the Save Component as Task Pane, for basic info, change the name. You can modify the description if you want. For example, I can write Tutorial Robot. And then make sure the new VCID option is selected. I'll then click the Save As button. And we want to make sure we have the right file name. So I'll make it C8-A701S. Save. And now we have our new robot, but we're not done yet. We still have to update the kinematic structure of our robot, because remember, our template robot was a lot bigger than the robot we're modeling right now. So to see the kinematic structure of a component, we can go to the structure group here and turn on the show option. So notice here the distances or length between the links and the robot are too far apart, so we need to change these. To do that, let's go to our component graph panel, under the root node expand behaviors, and then select this behavior called kinematics. This is actually an articulated kinematics behavior created by visual components used for articulated robots. You can find this behavior if you go to the behaviors drop down menu here, and then you can find it under kinematics. So what we need to do is change the distances in the robot's links along certain axes, which is what these L type properties are referring to in the properties panel. To find these values, let's go to our data sheet. And remember the dimensions of the robot are on page 17. Let's take a better view. And you want to focus on this drawing here. So this will give you the information you need. So the distance between link 0 and 1 along the z-axis is 472. That's what this value is referring to. And that's what you can see here, L01Z. If you are new to reading data sheets, don't worry. If we go to the PDF tutorial, I do give you the values you need in step six. So for L12X should be 100. You can see here in the properties panel it is 100. For L23Z, it's 300. Here you can see it's 650. Ho oh ho! So that's probably this length right here. So let's change L23Z to 300. And we can see the change in the 3D world. Let's now go back to our PDF. L34X should be negative 30. It is negative 30. L34Z is 310. But in the robot right now, it's 650. So let's change that from 650 to 310. And you can see the change happened here. I think that's all the changes we have to make. L56Z should be 80, and that is the right value there. Let's now go on to the next step, which is to update the joint properties of the robot. So we need to set the max speed, the max acceleration and deceleration, as well as the minimum and maximum limits to the robot's joints. Now, joints in a robot in a visual components product are stored in links or nodes. So if you go to the component graph panel, J1 is referring to the first joint in the robot. So if I select the node here, go to the link properties panel, you can see it has its own set of joint properties. So we're going to update the first joints, min and max limit, max speed, max acceleration, and deceleration. Let's go to our data sheet. And the specifications table is on page 23. And we can see that we're working with the C8A701 robot. So we're going to be referring to this column here. The max operating speed for the first joint in the robot is 331. We can see right now that J1 is 200. So let's change it to be 331. The max acceleration and deceleration are four times the max speed so we need to change that. Let's get out our trusty calculator. 331 times 4 is 1,324. Let's copy that value and change max acceleration to 1,324 and do the same for our max deceleration. Let's find the min and max limits for the first joint in our data sheet. So the min and max range for the first joint, it's plus or minus 240 degrees. 
which you can see here. So this is actually the same for all three robots in the C8 series. But they are different for the second joint. So let's go there now. J2 node in the robot is referring to its second joint. Let's go back to our spec sheet. So the max operating speed for joint 2 in a robot is 332. Right now it's at 167, so let's change that. It'll be 332. What is that times 4? Let's get the calculator. 332 times 4 is 1,328. Let's copy that. We can set it for max acceleration and max deceleration. Let's now update the min and max limits for the second joint. The max motion range for joint 2 in our robot is negative 158 plus 65. So 158, 65. The min limit is changed from 135, negative 135 to negative 158. Max limit was, I don't remember, sorry, 65. So the max limit is 65. And there we go. Let's now go on to joint 3, which is J3 node in the robot. Go to our data sheet. Joint 3, max operating speed is 450 degrees. Right now it's 200 in the robot, so let's change that to 450. What is that value times 4? 4? 450 times 4 is 1800. So we can copy that value and set 1800 for max acceleration and max deceleration. For the min and max limit of our third joint, I think that is different. So the max motion range for joint 3, it's actually the same for all three robots, so negative 61 to plus 202. This is a conditional expression here, but we can just write 61, sorry, negative 61. Was it negative 61? <laughs> Second guessing myself. It's negative 61, okay. So for joint 4 and 5 and 6, it's actually the same for all three robots in the series, so that should be fine. Let's just double check the max operating speed for the rest of the joints. So for joint 4, it should be a max speed of 450, and I believe that was correct. Yes, so the max acceleration and deceleration are okay. And the motion range is plus or minus 200, and that is correct as well. Let's go to J5 for our fifth joint. And joint 5 should be 450. It's 450 with a motion range of plus or minus 135, and that is correct. For joint 6, it should be 720 with a motion range of plus or minus 360. I think that's going to be the same. And it is, yes. So 720 with the correct max acceleration, deceleration, and our motion range. Let's now save our work. So let's go back to our component group. And this time we're going to click Save Component because we've already created our robot as a new component. So we're just updating the changes we made. Click Save. And there we go. Let's find out what the next step is. So we updated the joint values. And here I give you an example of how to update the first joint in J1. We now have to move the geometry that we're working with into the correct nodes in the robot, or links. Now whenever you're moving geometry, you can hold down the shift key for the geometry to retain its position in the 3D world. Otherwise, the geometry will inherit the offset of the node. And I can show you how this works. Before we go there, you can see you're moving the ARM1 geometry into J1, the ARM2 geometry into J2. So you can follow this list here. But I will show you how it's done. We don't need to see the kinematic structure anymore. But let's actually move some geometry around first. The geometry is in the root node of the robot right now. So select it here in the component graph panel. Let's move the ARM1 geometry. I'll hold down the shift key and drag it into J1. And you can see it kept its position. Let's now go back to our root node and move arm 2 into the second joint. But this time, let's see what happens when we do not hold down the shift key. So I'll drag and drop arm 2. 
into J2. And ho ho! You can see the geometry, it inherited the offset at this joint, so that's why it's all the way up here. So to fix this, let's drag it back to our root node without holding on the shift key, so now it will inherit the root node's offset and go back to its original position. I'll now hold on the shift key and drag the arm2 geometry into J2 and you can see it's now in that node and it also retained its position in the 3D world. Let's do the same for the other geometries. Go back to my root node. Arm3 geometry, hold down shift and drag into J3 node. Looks fine. Go back to your root node. Arm4, hold down shift, drag into J4. Looks good. Go back to your root node, arm5 geometry, hold down shift, move into J5, looks good. Go back to the root node, drag arm6, hold down shift, and then drag it actually into J6. And it looks fine too. Let's now go to our show group and turn off the show option. And maybe you know what we need to do now. Yes, save your work. So in the component group, I'll click the save component and then the Save Component Task Pane, I'll click Save to update my work. Now the reason why we're doing this is to not only save our work but also create backups. To see what I'm talking about, I can go to my Home tab, go to my eCatalog panel, and I was saving the robot in my My Models folder. So if I go here now and show it in Explorer, you can see that I've created the new component file as, long, as well as two backups. So I can reload these backups in case I make a mistake. But we didn't. So now I think all we have left to do is just test our robot. Let's go back to our PDF tutorial. And yep, that's it. So review. What we did is we modeled a robot using a data sheet and a CAD file. We then used a template robot from our eCatalog panel to make it easy process to model the new robot. A part of that process was moving the geometry we imported into the template robot and then we saved our work to not only create the new robot component file but backups. And last but not least we have to test our work. So what you can do is run the robot through a series of tests. You can do this on your own or you can try to follow along with me in the video. You could stop watching at this point if you are familiar with how to use our software. So if we go to the program tab I'll use the jog command to select the robot in the 3D world. The first test is the forward kinematics of the robot. I'll interact with its joints. So it's rotating, that's good. J2 is rotating. J3, it's moving up and down, that's good. J4, that's fine. J5, and J6. You can also use the joint slider controls here in the jog panel. Let's now reset, and the robot does go back to its joint initial state. This is fine. In the program editor panel, I'll now teach some motion statements to the robot. Let's move over here, make that a point-to-point -point motion. And then move over here. You might notice something in the jog panel that J5, as I'm moving in this direction, is approaching zero, so that could create a singularity. So I'll just move the robot down here, make that a linear motion, and then let's just jog the robot all the way over here and make that a point-to-point -point motion. Reset, run the simulation, that looks fine. When you're testing, you can use virtual time or real time. I actually prefer to use real time. Let's reset. I'll now test the signal actions of the robot. So for tracing, let's do that now. We don't need this linear motion statement. I'll delete that. Let's now add a set binary output statement. You can do tracing from signals 17 through 34 using a tool frame in the robot. So output port is 17, a true value will turn on tracing. Let's reset, run the simulation, and tracing works, so it traced this line, that's fine. Let's now try grasping and releasing. I'll go to my home tab, and in my eCatalog panel I'll expand models by type, go to products and containers, and I'll do a quick search for a cylinder. Drag the first item in, and I might need to move this a bit. I don't know if the robot can reach it. Let's see, right about there is fine. Let's now go back to our program tab, and 
instead of signaling the trace action, let's actually delete these three statements from the robot's program. Use my jaw command, and now let's snap the robot to the top face center of the cylinder here. This will be our pick position, so make that a linear motion. I will signal a grasp action, so signals 1 through 16 in the robot. You can use tool frames for grasping by default. A true value will signal a grasp action, so let's lift up. And then make this our retract and approach position. Make the approach position first in our main routine. Reset. Run the simulation. And yes, the robot can pick up parts. Let's now do the opposite. Let's release the part. I'll reset, and I'm actually going to copy the main routine. So I'll click Copy Sequence. And then after we pick up the part, let's call the subroutine we just created, called Sequence 1. Run the simulation. And I forgot to make one change. The robot's not broken. <laughs> it's just that in Sequence 1, I was signaling a true action for grasping, but it needs to be false to signal a release action. And yep, it works. Let's now mount and dismount a tool. I'll go to my Home tab. Under Models by Type, I'll expand Tools, click Visual Components, and I'll add a generic vacuum gripper. You probably want to test if the tools can be plugged into the robot at the end of its arm, so let's use the PMP command, which is turned on by default, and plug our gripper to the end of the robot. And it does. Let's go to our Program tab, Jog the Robot, and the gripper is moving with it, so that's good. The connection is fine. We'll go back to my home tab and I'm going to disconnect the gripper from the robot or unplug it. But now I'm going to use a signal action to mount this tool and dismount it. Go to the program tab. We don't need this sequence, let's delete it. And with these statements, we can delete them as well. Because what we want to do now is jog our robot to pick up this tool or mount it, sorry. So this is where we're going to mount the tool. I'll make that a linear motion. Add a set binary output statement. You can use signals, oh, I believe it's 34 through 48 for mounting and dismounting tools with tool frames. Those are default signal actions. So that was 34? <laughs> I think it was 35. And then let's use an output value of true to mount the tool. Move back. This will be our approach and retract position. Make the approach position the first statement. And let's see what happens. Yep, so it mounted a tool and it brought it back here. Let's now do the reverse. I'll copy my main routine and then call that sequence at the end to verify that the robot can dismount a tool. So let's add a call sequence statement to sequence one, run the simulation. And once again, sorry, I forgot to change the output value to false to signal a dismount. So let's change output value to false in sequence one. Run the simulation again. Yep, so I verified the robot can mount and dismount tools. Let's also see if the robot can sweep geometry, which by default you can use signal action 81. Let's delete this sequence here. We don't need these statements. I'll reset and let's move the robot all the way over here. Make that a point-to-point -point motion statement and I'll use a set binary output statement to signal swept volume using output port of 81 with a true value. So this will turn on the swept volume or sweeping geometry which by default is the robot's geometry. So if I reset and run the simulation it did not happen so let's find out why. Is it signal 81 or 80? Let's check. I'll select the robot as a component, and then in my Component Properties panel, I'll go to Actions Configuration section here. For the signal actions, I'll go to Output Signal of 81, and that is for sweeping the geometry, so it's on and off, and we're using the robot. So let's find out what went wrong. Ah, yes, sorry, sorry, sorry. I forgot to turn on swept volume before I moved to position 1. So let's actually just drag the output, uh, set binary output statement to be the first statement. So 
I'll turn on the sweat volume and then go to position one. Reset, run the simulation, and yes, there's the robot's geometry that was swept to this position. So we know that is working as well. Let's also test the stop at limits option here. So if I try to drag the robot all the way here, you can see it stops, it stops. Let's also use the joint sliders here. And there we go, that works. Let's now try the inputs and outputs of the robot. So I'll go back to my home tab. We don't need these two components, so I will delete them. Let's now add a feeder and a conveyor. In my eCatalog panel, I'll click feeders. I'll add a basic feeder. We don't have to worry about picking or placing anything. This is just for testing. Then I'll go to conveyors new and add a new conveyor and plug it into the feeder. Let's now add a conveyor sensor. So my eCatalog panel, I'll click processors, add a conveyor sensor. Plug it into my conveyor. So this will detect parts that move along the conveyor. Let's also add a conveyor motor and connect that to the conveyor so this can turn on or off the conveyor's path. Let's wire the motor and the sensor as inputs and outputs to the robot. Obviously this robot is a bit too small to work with these components, but it's just for testing these signals are working. So with the robot selected, I'll go to my program tab and in the connect group I'll use the signals command. We now want to wire the motor signal as an output in the robot. And by default, signal actions 1 through 100, or sorry, 1 through 99, are kind of reserved for those action signals I already showed you. So whenever you're connecting new signals to a robot, it's always recommended to use ports 100 onward in the robot. So right now I'm connected to port 0 in the robot, so let's double click this and change it to 100. And this is an output. So I can send a value to the motor to turn on or off the conveyor, but we do want to get input from the sensor boolean signal here in the sensor. So let's drag that as an input and change its port to be 101. Now you can verify all this in the connect signals task pane here. So I will go to the signal column and use the signal filters to just show only connected signals. And you can see output 100 in the robot is connected to the motor signal input of 101 is connected to the sensor's boolean signal. Let's now test this connection. So in my main routine I'll delete these two statements. Let's add a wait for binary input statement. We're waiting for a signal in the sensor. So a signal port of 101, the input value should be true. And then when the part reaches the sensor let's send out a signal to our conveyor motor using output port of 100 with a false value to turn off the conveyor. Let's now test. Here comes the part. Anticipation. And yep, so we can verify that the robot got the signal from the sensor. It then sent out a signal to the motor to turn off the path. We can verify this. You can run the simulation. And you can see parts don't move onto the conveyor. Great. Let's now finally test if the robot can connect to other components. So I will Go back to my home tab. We don't need the feeder or the conveyor. And since the motor and sensor are connected to the conveyor as child components, when I delete the conveyor, they're also deleted. But now we want to test that a robot can connect to a track. So in my eCatalog panel, I'll go to my robot positioners, visual components. I'll add a robot floor track, as well as a pedestal. And let's see if the robot can plug into the pedestal using the PMP command. And it does. You can see. Let's now try plugging it into the track here, its platform. And it is connected. So let's actually interact with the platform and the robot is moving with it. Let's now add a, ro a workpiece positioner that can give the robot more external accesses. I'll go to my eCatalog panel expand workpiece positioners, visual components, and add this item here called workpiece positioner. The robot can't physically connect to this component, they have to connect remotely. I'll go to my connect interfaces command here. And let's now connect the positioner, its interface, to an interface in the robot, which is why the robot's highlighted yellow, it has an available connection. So I'll click the robot, and that creates a connection. 
Let's now test the connection. So I'll close out the command, go back to the program tab, and I'll then use the jaw command to select the robot. And what I need to verify now is that the robot inherited or imported the external axes from the track as well as the positioner. And you can see it did. So it gets the robot floor tracks joint, which is why I can move it, and the positioner's axes as well. So I can move them like this and like this. And we can test these values by adding a point-to-point -point motion statement or just a regular motion statement. It could be linear or point-to-point. -point. So add a point-to-point. -point. If I reset, run the simulation, yes. So the connection between the robot and these components is, are working and it's also using their joints, which you can see here in the statement properties panel, P1, it got the E1, E2, and E3. These are the external joints in the robot and the values for this motion statement. Okay, this completes the video. If you have any more questions, please feel free to visit our forum at forum.visualcomponents.com. And as always, I hope you have a wonderful day.